Good evening everybody, Lenny here, and today we're going to be talking about the concept of horror. Just in general, not necessarily pertaining to any specific medium, but just what it is in general. The reason why I'm doing this video is because ideas about horror can conflict between people. So at the very least, we're going to go over the base concepts of it, as well as my personal opinions about what makes horror good. Because in the following weeks, Silent Hill 2 and other games are going to be the focus. With that in mind, the term good horror or well-executed horror is going to be brought up a lot. And in order to make sure there's no confusion between you, the viewers, and me, we need to clarify what that means and what that entails when we're talking about it. So, first thing. What actually is something that you could label as a horror movie, horror game, horror book, or just in the horror genre in general? Well, it's tough to explicitly state whether or not something is for sure horror or not. But to put it as its most simplest form, it is any form of media or fiction or entertainment that's primary goal is to scare you. Now, that's not to say that there aren't things that you can call horror that aren't actually scary or not trying to scare you, but that's a very basic thing. The only exceptions would be comedy horror films where they are meant to make you laugh, but they contain elements of horror, which is typically something that we would say is either supernatural or bloody or just dramatic and dark. Now, the thing we have to discuss is what makes good horror? How can we differentiate between a movie that is factually good or factually bad? And then everything in between, since horror can also be subjective. Do you want horror that's more in your face, or do you want horror that tends to be more slow brew, subtle, or just slower? Horror in and of itself is only effective if you have a good level of immersion. And there are two ways that you can immerse a person. One you can immerse them from a third-person perspective into the world. And what that would entail is usually what has to happen in the case of books and movies. You're usually not presented a situation that seems truly immersive, because as you're reading a book, you're very aware that you're reading a book, you're just reading, you know, words. It's just ink on a piece of paper in a book and you're in your house. You're not actually in any of these situations. Same thing with a movie. You realize that you're looking at a square with light coming out of it and that you're not genuinely in a cave with monsters in it. So in order to immerse you in these situations, you have two methods that you can do from the third person angle. The first method is to create a situation that is relatable to anyone who might be reading or watching. So spending time with a relative who you might think is creepy or swimming in the ocean or wandering around someplace at night are all things that happen to people on a semi-regular basis. And so putting a twist on that that can make it more frightening or harmful to you is something that can create genuine horror. Alternatively, what you need to do is create a sort of proxy for the person, usually the main character. And the way that you do this is you make them either likable relatable, or at the very least, interesting to the person who's reading it. If you can make them relatable to the person, then they will see qualities of themselves within this character, and therefore place a similar value of desire for safety and well-being onto them. Same thing if they're likable, because even if you can't relate to them, you enjoy their presence, you enjoy reading about them, and therefore them being in a stressful, harmful, or lethal situation is far from pleasurable or desirable for the reader. And finally, it's a matter of something interesting. Even if you don't find them likable or if you don't find them relatable, if you still have an interest in seeing what happens to them, that can still be a hook for the reader to continue pursuing forward in reading or watching or what have you. So if we're gonna take some examples from some classic literature or film, you could have the example of Cujo by Stephen King in which Many people have had experiences where they were frightened of a dog, so make a killer dog. Easy way to make something frightening. Same with 
other horror classics such as many slasher films. In the original slasher film cases, the idea was to create characters who you would find entertaining or likable. So in the case of the original Halloween or the original Friday the 13th or the original Nightmare on Elm Street, they had a cast of characters who at least tried to be entertaining, which depending on your interpretation may or may not have worked, but you don't want to see them get injured. So having them being followed or chased by people who want to bring them harm can create that sense of tension. So that's how you do it from a third person perspective, and that's pretty much the only way that you can do it with those mediums. But you have a very, very precious opportunity when it comes to video games. Video games allow you first person immersion. Since you are the main character, have direct control over their actions and their outcome, you need usually very little desire from a character or narrative standpoint to keep yourself safe. You don't have to think, hmm, do I like this character? Are they relatable? None of this matters because these frightening situations will be impeded on someone who is a direct avatar and locus of control for yourself. This is why horror games usually have sort of a leeway in regards to character development. You don't have to have a likable, complex, or even well-intentioned main character ever in a horror game, because for all intents and purposes, if you choose not to like them and you're like, oh, I don't like them, I just I don't care if they die, well then that's you and you can't proceed forward with the game, and there's no point in playing a game if you aren't going to proceed forward with it, with a few exceptions, obviously. In fact, this is a perfect reason why we have so many silent protagonists in many games. The idea of this person being a blank slate makes it so much easier for the idea of us being in this position to someone very simple. You don't have to worry about their ideas conflicting with your own because they have none. You can't worry if their voice doesn't match your own because they have none. You don't have to worry about any of that, you know, marital status, political views, uh, politeness or demeanor towards their companions. None of it matters because none of it is presented for someone who is a silent protagonist, at least not in most cases. So then, we're presented with somewhat of a different dilemma. Since the issue is not necessarily with characterization, since immersion is extremely easy to perform due to the format of video games, why is it that horror video games are still relatively hard to pull off? The answer is, many people do not understand the core concept of what makes something genuinely scary instead of just startling. I could go on and on and on about why I hate jump scares, but to put it in brief and perhaps to save it for a future video, a jump scare is something that is supposed to be earned. You build up tension and then it pays off and you get a successful jump scare. But many people in Hollywood and the video game industry instead will basically skip the first step and get right to the end. You know games like this, you have a lot of American horror movies that tend to have so many loud undeserved jump scares. You have many games that tend to have a lot of loud undeserved jump scares, especially among the indie horror scene. And what it comes down to is there is nothing particularly scary about something that only startles you. So let's give you an example of a scene that is relatively scary without any jump scares.
Okay. If that scene was effective, which I assume it is, I want to try and make sure that we have something effective here with this clip, that should scare you. Not necessarily something to make you, like, keep you up at night, but at least you understand the idea that it is trying to be effective at being scary. Okay? Now we're gonna play a second clip. Okay, so what was that? Why, that was a cute little kitten. It's just a cute little kitten, look at it. It's, it's got, it's got even got like a hundred dollar bill right in front of it. Are you scared of that? I mean, I understand if you're a dog person, you don't like cats, that's fine. But it's got money with it. You can use that to buy goods and services. But, a good portion of you were most likely startled because it came out of nowhere, you didn't really get any sort of good warning for it, but because of the fact that it was a very sudden image and it was very loud, you were most likely startled in some sense. Does that make it good horror? It doesn't. It's not. It's something that's not even remotely scary but presented in a situation that's just supposed to be a sudden assault on the senses. This is the problem that we can have with video games. And it's also a problem of how much control do you have over this? So you remember before I said I had the idea of a locus of control? This is a graph. The higher the amount of control you have over the situation, the lower the amount of scares and the lower amount of control you have over the situation, then the higher amount of scares that you have. Now, that's not to say that a game can make you completely helpless, because then the idea of being completely hopeless might make people just give up and immediately and choose not to be scared and give in to their fate. In fact, that's something that a lot of people might do in horror games where they're presented with a hopeless situation. They will put the controller down, cross their arms, and wait for the scary thing to happen so that they can die. And sometimes this can be problematic, but for all intents and purposes, this is a roughly accurate graph. So I bring this up because one of the most effective horror games in recent memory for, you know, most people at least, is either Amnesia The Dark Descent or any of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. Both of them are effective because they essentially take a significant amount of control away from the player and you are then forced to deal with a situation where you are, for all intents and purposes, surviving by the edge of your seat, by just the sheerest fraction of luck. Because coming out of a situation that you appear to be hopeless is a lot more frightening and enthralling and just exciting than when you have a lot of control and you have a sort of certainty about your ability to continue. So what do we have on the opposite end of the spectrum? We have two of the most well-respected games ever, Dead Space 3 and Fear 3. What is the issue that plagues both of these games? Well, they're very different games. They're made by different studios, they have different stories, they have different protagonists. They have a different way of approaching each of the conflicts. One is about supernatural stuff, mainly pertaining to ghosts and psychic beings and government black ops projects. The other one has to do with religious zealots and interstellar zombies. So nothing that much in common except for one thing. At this point in the series, both of the games have become highly focused on action and spectacle. And it's very easy to realize that this is the worst thing you can do for something that is meant to be scary. Like, okay, let's present the idea of you going down one of two hallways. On the hallway to your left is a zombie, and on the way to that zombie is a gun. And on the right, you have a man with a knife, but you do not have any weapons. Now, which of those two would you go down? Obviously, you'd go down the one on the left, 
because since you have a gun, you're able to take care of the zombie, shoot it in the head, proceed with your day, la di da di da The one on the right is definitely more scary, because even though a man with a knife is technically less of a threat to you than a zombie could be, the fact that you are defenseless makes it infinitely more terrifying. So, Dead Space 3 doesn't have that. You have a lot more action, you have a lot more options for your arsenal, you have many more things focused on combat rather than genuine terror. And even the times when they do try to genuinely scare you, you're presented so many options to deal with a situation that it falls completely on its face. Same with Fear 3, just if you look at the trailer, you can see that the focus of this is not to be scary, but to incite action and catharsis. You should not be excited to go into these scary situations because of the idea of the fun and cool guns and powers you get to play as. Because using guns and your psychic powers, that looks awesome. It looks like a supernatural Michael Bay movie. You don't go to Michael Bay to be scared except for how shitty his movies are, but to get off of that, every single time that a horror franchise moves towards combat or anything that can make you able to have a higher degree of control always falls completely on its face. Now, there are games that can get away with this, and what is that? That is what we'd like to call the supernatural action game, which is where you can have elements of horror, but it is not necessarily the focus and therefore does not derive away from your ability to enjoy it or consider it to be critically good. My main contender for this is going to be The Darkness. That is a game that deals with a lot of elements of horror. But if you just look at the trailer and the game itself, there are very few instances in the game where it genuinely tries to scare you, and instead it gives you catharsis over horror from the beginning, as opposed to these other games, Dead Space 3 and Fear 3, where they start off with their original incarnations being entirely about scaring you and then give you power over time as the series progresses. The Darkness was never trying to actually scare you, it was trying to give you a method of catharsis through action sequences, but through the plot guise of things that would usually be present in a horror or supernaturally themed movie. To bring this all home, Silent Hill Homecoming is also a bad contender of this, and we're going to put it side by side with Resident Evil 5. Both of these games are significantly easier and significantly more focused on freeform combat. That's not to say that they don't have any sort of difficulty to them, but it's the idea of you have a fair amount of control over the combat. You can never be scared of something that you have control over. And this is why these two games are considered the low points, if not the worst, in the series, respectively. And to put it in more simple terms, and to put a wrap to this concept, fear as a whole can be determined on a very base Freudian level as fear of the unknown is what is a grand basis for horror. Things not being explained, things not being entirely in your control, things being unknown or just confusing can all be very, very scary concepts. This is why a lot of people can look at the first Halloween movie as being scary. You have no idea why Michael does the things that he does. Same thing with some of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. You don't understand the logic of the dream world, you don't understand how any of this is possible, and that can incite terror. Same thing with the first Alien movie. You hardly see any of the Alien until some of the final scenes of the movie, so 
since you don't have a full glimpse of it, you have these images in your head of what you think it could be. And your mind is so much better at creating things that scare you as opposed to anything that other people can do. Because even if H.R. Geiger is way better at making scary designs than any typical movie goer is, what it comes down to is your mind is your greatest enemy when it comes to scaring you. I myself am scared of sharks, so if I look into the ocean when I'm watching a movie, I am much more likely to see a shark, even if the person making the movie wants me to see a squid or an octopus or a kraken or anything like that. Because I am scared of what I'm scared of, and if you leave that vague room open, we will allow ourselves to become frightened if that's the way that the scene is playing out. Music is very important too, but that's a topic for another day. So tell me what you think horror is, tell me what you think is good about it, what's bad about it good ways to do it, anything within any of the mediums that applies to it. It can be books, movies, video games, anything that you think can help lend to the topic of discussion for this will be great. And next video we are looking at either Friday or Saturday for release and it will be covering the critical acclaim of Silent Hill 2 and how it relates to the expectations of gamers and critics in regards to horror games. See you next time.